Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, we'll just wait for a couple of seconds as, um, as everyone logs in. Brilliant. Well, thank you all very, very much for, for joining us um, for what is an unexpectedly topical uh, discussion. Um, so, so to set the background, um, we're joined today by um, Sir Michael Barber, who's chairing the Police Foundation's uh, Independent Strategic Review of Policing in the UK, which I think is the first such exercise for, 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 for many years. Um, Lisa Townsend, who's Police and Crime Commissioner in the Surrey. And of course, um, the Right Honourable Kit Malthouse, who is the Policing Minister and was um, responsible for, for the, these issues um, while working under Boris Johnson in, in London. Um, so we then have a... Um, uh, we, 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 so um, the independent uh, review is um, being launched um, in a couple of weeks' time. So the the plan for this this meeting was was to for, for Sir Michael to preview its contents and for for, for Kit to respond. But then obviously um, last week we had a, a quite extraordinary um, uh, event when um, when the the uh, commissioner of the Metropolitan Police was dismissed uh, from her role by the Mayor of London, uh, or effectively by the Mayor of London, um, which is has brought these issues of, of policing um, completely to the forefront of, um, of, of the agenda. So we're, I'm really pleased to be hosting this discussion. I'm really pleased that you can all join us. Um, and um, please do ask your questions in the, in the Q&A or if you're watching us on YouTube or on Twitter or any other, or Facebook or any other platform, if you put your questions in the comments, um, our team should be able to see them and, and pass them on to me. So um, with that, I'll introduce uh, Sir Michael. Well, thank you very much, Robert for hosting this at the Centre for Policy Studies and thanks to all your colleagues for setting it up. Um, it's also a pleasure to work with uh, Lisa and Kit on this discussion, which I think, as you rightly say, Robert, is very topical. Um, the Independent Strategic Review was uh, originally launched a couple more than a couple of years ago and we've been um, working away uh, in the background and we're gonna launch our report on the 8th of March. And it's great to have this conversation ahead of that about the challenges facing policing. Um, the Police Foundation has hosted the report. It's a think tank that has worked on policing issues for a number of years and does some uh, fantastic work. Uh, and it's been a pleasure for me to work with them. Uh, so we're gonna have a, a very substantial report. As you said, Robert, one uh, probably more substantial than anything that's been done for decades with, it'll have the final report will have over 250 pages and 50 plus recommendations. Before I get into the challenges facing policing, I do want to say one thing though. There are many thousands of police officers across this country uh, who uh, are doing incredibly tough jobs and they're professional, they're hardworking, they're making an important contribution to all of our lives every single day. And I want to pay tribute to them because when we get into the debate about policing culture and some of the challenges facing policing, I don't want that to be a criticism of the hardworking professional officers that anybody can meet all day, every day out on the streets and elsewhere working on our behalf. So tribute to them. But there are some major challenges, and if you talk to police officers at the front line, they agree there are some major challenges. There are challenges to do with the culture, to do with technology, to do with the society and the way it's changing, and to do with public confidence in the policing. And I want to very briefly touch on those. So I'm just going to be a, a handful of slides, five minutes, uh, and then, of course, people can uh, start the debate, ask questions, uh, and raise anything they wish. The first thing to say is um, that the nature of crime has changed since I was working in number 10 uh, 20 years ago. At that time, the main crimes, the big volume crimes, as we called them, were burglary, car crime uh, and robbery. If you look at the next slide, uh, Margot, please, um, you'll see that now 40 percent plus of all crime is fraud, most of it, almost all of it online. Um, and sometimes online crime gets kind of dismissed as a victimless crime. But actually, these are people losing their pensions. Uh, their savings. Uh, it's a devastating crime. And you can see that traditional bobbies on the beat aren't the answer to this big change in crime. So that's a big change over 20 years. The, the pattern of crime has changed in relation to violent crime that rose significantly between 2015 and 2021. Uh, Kit will point out that that's, uh, there's been progress on that in the last year or so, and that's, uh, uh, that's important and good. Uh, and the, the government's uplift, the 20,000 extra police officers are very welcome and they're an important contribution, but they can't solve all the crimes that we face because the nature of crime is changing dramatically. The other thing to say about policing currently is that the police are often distracted by effectively social problems. If I could have the next slide, Margot, please. So it, it, here's the big rise over a, a six year period in the number of missing persons incidents affecting the police. 
the police um obviously if a missing person is, re is reported the police have no choice uh, uh and would, wouldn't even think about not following that, that up but it's interesting that they spend three million investigation hours every year following up missing persons that's enough to pay for all the police officers in north yorkshire and i don't think when people are paying the police precept for wherever they are in the country sorry or anywhere else they think that that's the main thing they're paying for. The police always follow up. But what we need in that case is the original social services, often care homes for, for uh, teenagers, to do the job better in the first place and to prevent the person going missing. Um, the next slide, uh, Margot, shows the same thing. There's been a big rise in the number of mental health incidents that police uh, are called to. I spent some time on the front line with police officers in Warwickshire, the West Midlands, um, and South South Wales, and uh, and Gwent, and I went with one pair of police officers to a mental health incident. It was a young man who clearly had major mental health challenges. Um, they resolved it. They prevented violence uh, inside a, a, a household. Uh, but as they left, they were saying, "We'll be back in a short space of time because nobody will solve the underlying problem." Uh, and the police officers are very responsible people. They're the social service of last resort, and this is distracting them from the task that I think the vast majority of the public want them to do, which is preventing crime uh, and uh, detecting crime. Next slide, please. Um, and partly as a result of um, the austerity when the number of police officers fell, fell dramatically, now being addressed by uh, Kit Malthouse and his colleagues uh, in a very welcome way, partly because of these distractions that the police are facing that I've just talked about, detection rates are very significantly down. And you see that on this graph here. Uh, and the percentage of crimes being detected is now below 10%. Uh, that can't be anything close to ideal. Uh, and it affects confidence in policing uh, because police are unable to do the basics uh, as re revealed in this graph. Although Kit okay, will doubtless point out that um, his appointment as uh, policing minister coincides with uh, the, the line changing direction sharply. Yes, well, uh, yes, and I, uh, Kit and I have talked about that, and, and it is, it's encouraging to see that, and I think that the, the, the growth in the number of police officers, some of these things will be affected. If we move on to the next graph, um, you'll see that public confidence fell in line with uh, that uh, failure to charge and, and some of the other things, the visit, lack of visibility as, as community policing retreated, the lack of detection I've just revealed, uh, and so on. And it fell particularly on the next graph in the Met, which you see... Uh, you can move the graph on, Margot. You see it, it's fallen most steeply in the Met. Um, and uh, Kit can claim that um, it fell after he left as well. So his, his, um, his credit will be, will be up. But the, but the problem is significant. And that's partly a result of the various uh, scandals and uh, really serious incidents that have been reported in the last six months. But it's also a sense among the public that uh, the basics aren't being done as, as they need to be done. Uh, and so confidence is falling. And that's a serious problem because policing by consent right back to the beginning, 1829, the Metropolitan Police Act has been based on policing by consent. And policing by consent de depends on the quality of the relationship between the public and the police. And if public confidence is falling, uh, that can't be good news. Um, and that's why I think there is a crisis of confidence in policing. Uh, and the next Met commander will be an important part of addressing that as will the leaders of the other 42 police forces in the country as of course will what the government does uh, and there are three capacity challenges on last slide three challenges facing the police uh, the i've mentioned that so ne next slide margaret thank you um the there's a capacity challenge there aren't enough police they haven't got the best technology those things are being addressed the the, the new spending review will will help address that at the twenty thousand uplift will help address that there's a capability challenge if you talk to any police officers Police learning, police training, uh, police uh, uh, career development is not what it needs to be, and that needs to be addressed, and that's part of changing the culture in a positive way. And finally, there's an organisational challenge, uh, and particularly, and I'm, I'm glad to say that the Home Secretary and Kit have been doing this, strengthening the centre, because while we want the 43 police forces to be able to effectively tackle local crime, some of these uh, things like fraud, like international crime, like serious and organised crime, need to be addressed strategically from the centre, and that is now being addressed. So there, there are big challenges of capacity, capability and organisation. And if we get those three things right over the next few years, then we can address the crisis in public confidence.
Thank you very much, Sir Michael. And um, in the introduction, I should have said, obviously, that um, Sir Michael is one of the most experienced um, uh, experts in public sector delivery, having worked uh, for Tony Blair um, and set up his delivery unit and having recently done the same for, for, for Boris Johnson. Um, so um, let's go now to, to Lisa, um, you, I mean, who as a PCC is, um, is overseeing, uh, is, is to con helping to confront these, these problems in, or if, if, you, if you share the diagnosis, is helping to confront these problems in, in, on, on the ground? Yeah, I, I think Sir Michael raises some really interesting issues and as, as Police and Crime Commissioner in Surrey, and I was elected in May, so I'm, I'm less than a year into my term, but I, I certainly recognise a lot of the challenges that have been raised um, in this review, but also I think more generally, I think it is really interesting, and, and you said at the beginning of it that we're having this conversation at, at what is a very topical conversation at a really interesting time, and I think that a lot of the time, these conversations that we're having around policing, and I'm sure a lot of the conversations that, that Kit's having um, at Cabinet and elsewhere, are conversations that would have largely been had actually in, in private and would have gone quite under the radar. Um, and even where we were having them in public, they probably weren't terribly well attended and nobody was that interested. And I think interest, public interest in policing is really, really high at the moment. Um, and I think it is for a lot of the reasons that Sir Michael set out. Um, and it is around public confidence and it is around how we feel about policing by consent and a lot of these issues and Surrey, certainly the, the lovely um, leafy county that we're always called, um, is not immune to any of these things. I also think it's really interesting that um, we are talking about policing and a lot of the challenge that we're facing, which are very, very public at the moment, at a time when policing is moving into much more of the private realm, actually. And it used to, of course, always be the case that the policing was done um, and the police were seen as being um, there to very much to police our public space, whether that was our, you know, our towns and city centres, um, you know, our rural areas, but very much sort of in the outside and in public. And we saw that, you know, whether that was public order and other things. And increasingly, of course, we're seeing policing coming into our private spaces. Now, some of those private spaces are things like Twitter, which are still quite public, um, but also private spaces and, and looking at, you know, looking at domestic abuse, looking at a lot of those crimes that happen behind closed doors. Now, I think that's a very, very good thing. And I think it is a good thing that police are doing that. And I also think it's a good thing that we're talking about it in public. And um, as PCC in Surrey, championing um, prevention work around for violence against women and girls is something that's incredibly important to me and um, I think it's a good thing again and something else I think it's very good we're talking about um, but Sir Michael also mentioned something that is very much happens in the private realm and that is fraud and in Surrey we, you know again we're not immune to this we have a lot of very wealthy people living in Surrey um, and they are not at all immune to, to being targeted um, by those criminals who um, you know whether it's around cyber fraud romance fraud is a really big issue um, in Surrey as well that's you know where people are um sort of uh sort of targeted um sort of by people sort of uh, claiming to be somebody that they're not claiming to be somebody that's interested in them romantically um and then as sir michael said you know often pensions and other things are, are unfortunately um the target and there, i don't believe there's any such thing um, as a victimless crime i believe all, all crimes have a victim somewhere but again these are things that are happening very much um sort of in public space and what i find really interesting is everywhere i go every whether it's a parish council whether it's a residence meeting when i'm speaking to councillors and mps right across Across Surrey, the one thing that comes up over and over again is visible policing. And that's something um, that the minister will you know, be hearing about all the time from colleagues as well, and I'm sure from constituents in his own patch in Hampshire. And it is really, really important. But I do think that we do have to have a very honest conversation with the public about what we mean about visible policing. And again, Sir Michael has referenced this, um, but the, the bobby on the beat isn't necessarily going to be the answer to a lot of the, um, the current types of crime that we're facing, unfortunately. And I do say to people when I, when I speak to them, and I do get asked the question an awful lot in, uh, in meetings, meetings in parish council meetings and others you know why why don't we see more police on our streets and the truth is I say to you know I say to a lot of the residents in Surrey um, you know if the most vulnerable in our society are not necessarily the ones that are helped most by by a bobby on the beat you think about your nine-year-old granddaughter who's up in her bedroom looking at her mobile phone do you have any idea what she's looking at would you know how to to look at it you know even if you could get hold of the device or you think about your elderly grandmother who's sitting at home who lives on her own and has been on her own an awful lot, particularly following COVID. Um, do you know who's contacting her on her landline? Do you know who's able to get at her through her, you know, through her computer screen? And all of those things require a very different kind of policing. And I am um, a huge, huge fan of Bobby's on the Beat. I, I want to see more visible policing, but I think we need to make sure that we've got a police force um, and we need to make sure that we've got police officers who are every bit as comfortable on the digital beat as they are on the physical beat. And that's something in Surrey that we're working really hard 
around and making sure that we've got. So I really welcome the CPS hosting this conversation. I'm a long time admirer and, and supporter of the CPS um, and I look forward to having a really interesting conversation this afternoon. Thanks uh, so much. And um, now to uh, the man himself, um, Kit Mulhouse. Well, Robert, thanks very much indeed, and, th and thanks for having me. Uh, what I hope will be an interesting discussion. I'm conscious that we're we want to open the floor up to people, so I'll be I'll be quick. I think obviously talking to Michael um, uh, over the last uh, few months about his uh, review um, and getting a sense of direction, it, it does come at a very opportune moment to think about what the next stage of of policing should look like. Because when you look at the long-term crime mission, it's worth appreciating the context, which is that even according to the British Crime Survey, current levels of crime are significantly below uh, where they were in the late 1990s, early 2000s, even including new crimes like fraud and, and cyber. So in the long term, under governments of all stripes, the fight against crime has been pretty much a resounding success. But the, the issue is, is uh, not necessarily that we could call it a success, but that we're in a, a less worse situation and that there's a moral imperative for us to try and drive even further improvement. And as Michael said, we've, had a, we've been through a, a sort of tumultuous phase the last few months, last year or so, uh, with policing, some of it driven by COVID, some of it driven by internal scandal and cultural problems which need to be addressed, which does mean it's a good time for us to think about the future of policing. And it's definitely in the, on the agenda from a media public consciousness point of view. But there's one question which I think Michael, both Michael and Lisa referred to, which I think we need to answer for, which is what is the future of policing not about? Because over the last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, certainly in my time in policing, we have laid an awful lot of society's problems at the feet of the police. Um, as Michael uh, pointed out, um, are the police supposed to be first responders to mental health incidents, um, which is absorbing a huge amount of response officers' times, as Michael pointed out. But when you talk to frontline cops, that was what they will say. Certainly over the last 10 years of my uh, involvement in policing, that has been the big rise in, in capacity uh, uh, occupation. Are the police responsible for relationship breakdown? As Lisa said, beyond the front door, uh, the nature of relationships, and are they responsible for community cohesion or where there is tension? Uh, are the police responsible, they've often assumed responsibility, for the demand side of the drugs equation rather than just the uh, supply, uh, that prevention work? Should the police be an arm of trading standards? Uh, for the sale of, of illegal goods online and, and elsewhere. And in particular, in the big growth area uh, that Michael pointed to on, on fraud and cyber, what realistically do we think the police uh, should be doing as opposed to the public sector or indeed the private sector as a whole from a prevention point of view? And of course, the great parallel to that, the great success over the last uh, 20 years has been car crime. Um, some of you on this call, I'm certainly old enough to remember, do you remember those car radio stereos used to remove from the car or the ones that had a front on them? This was the, the industry struggling with the technology to try and bring in prevention. The, the creation of the immobilizer means that car theft fell significantly. Um, you know, and in a situation where we see nearly 50% of thefts from vehicles because people leave the car open, uh, or indeed nearly 50% of burglaries because people leave a door or a window open. What is the role of the wider prevention um, uh, apparatus in society uh, to assist the police as they look to the future? So I think that's the, a question we have to ask. What, what realistically do we want the police to be doing? What is their future not about? And if there are problems that should be solved, well, undoubtedly mental health is one, who should be doing that and who is best equipped to do that, I think is, is the key thing. And the police, I think, talking to them would say that, that you know, other public sector organizations and indeed private sector stepping up to the mark uh, would make an enormous uh, difference, not least in the online space where they seem to be able to work out quite smartly what I want to buy and advertise it to me. But oddly, they don't seem to be able to work out when someone's trying to scam me or someone who's streaming child abuse or all these other horrors that happen 
online and get ahead of that prevention. Now, the government's doing work with them. Obviously, the online harms bill will help with some of that stuff. But these are the questions we have to ask. And then I think for the future, I think there are three, and I, I, I like Michael's uh, three priorities, and I, I sort of agreed with them uh, with some variation. The first one I think we need that the police deserve is a, is a clear and prioritized mission. Um, we often, I think, are guilty of asking them to do everything all the time, everywhere, um, rather than saying, here are the clear priorities that we want you to brigade yourself to deal with. Now, we've tried to do that in our beating crime plan. Uh, we've given some clear priorities around neighborhood crime and violence as a first order of business that we want sorted out. Um, and amongst that, um, as I hope you will all have seen, there is a big chapter in there called Excellence in the Basics. We do agree that there are basic requirements that the British people want from their police force um, that need to be fulfilled. A sense, as Lisa said, of governed space in the public realm, uh, that if they have a burglary, they will be visited, there will be an investigation, uh, that they are going to be safe uh, from violence when they head out into the public realm, that their children will make it home in one piece, that the phone will be answered um, in a timely fashion and they will get information about their inquiries ongoing. All these basics need to be fulfilled if that fundamental promise, that contract is, is going to be reinforced. But we, I think, as a, as a, a governing class, if you like, as the people who set the, the what run the how, and that includes police and crime commissioners, need to make sure we have a simple mission that is prioritized that allows the police to brigade themselves for success. The second area I think where we need to think carefully about the future is leadership and professionalism. Um, we can put in place all the culture, all the processes we like to deal with some of the, the, the cultural issues that have been thrown up by events over the last year or so. We can look at vetting, we can look at social media examination, we can look at internal disciplinary structures and all that stuff. But unless you get the leadership right uh, and therefore the culture right, uh, all of it will be fighting with one hand behind its back. And alongside that comes professionalism. To some controversy, we've tried to uh, improve professionalism in policing, bringing in the idea of uh, police officers joining and then acquiring a degree level qualification, that there is a, an idea of ongoing training and professional development uh, for the police throughout their career that we hope will lead to a, a greater sense of professionalism, but also focusing right throughout the whole range of, of ranks. Very often when we talk about leadership, we talk about the command course upwards. So that's commander and upwards, which is the very senior echelons of policing. But actually, for my part, the most important rank in any police force is sergeant. Um, that is the, the basic foundation of leadership. That is your frontline commander. Uh, that is the, you can get to lead to sergeant quite quickly, three to five years. Um, and you can therefore have a, a big impact on, on culture and process and professionalism and effect at the level of sergeant. And so working with the college of policing, I think over the next few years, that's very much where we'd like to concentrate. And then the third area um, is about the, the police's acquisition and use of, of technology. Um, I'm a great believer that there is enormous potential in crime prevention, never mind detection, in the acquisition of technology. But like all areas of the public sector, the police are have not been very good um, at acquiring technology in a coherent way and at scale. There's a lot of work going on across UK policing. A lot of it is driven by individual enthusiasms, by uh, officers or police and crime commissioners for particular projects or particular bits of kit. Um, we want to bring some coherence to that. And so the centre reinforcing the idea that technology should have a big role, but that we want a coherent and consistent approach to that acquisition is key. We now have a scientific advisor. We've got a group centralizing that work. You know, the use of AI for crime prediction and detection, um, the use of live facial recognition, which we think holds out enormous uh, potential, the development of forensic science and biometrics for the future, and then the, the better acquisition of data analysis and the better skilling up of our data analysis capability for the prediction uh, of crime, we do think holds out enormous potential to drive these numbers down um, even further. But critical to that, critical to any innovation, is allowing failure, uh, right? is allowing the police to experiment and for sometimes projects not to work out 
uh, they may they might otherwise have done. It doesn't mean you don't learn something from it. it doesn't mean it's not worth a try. But allowing them to use technology in a way in a safe space, um, I think will will help build resilience for the for the future. So. I'm very conscious that conversations about the future of policing are very often about structure. Uh, but I think actually we need to think in this overall context of massive falls in crime over the last 30 or 40 years, we need to now think about mission, leadership, technology to drive us to the next stage, as well as saying, what is the thicket, the swarm of wasps around a police officer's head uh, that we need to move aside uh, for others to deal with so that they can see that mission clearly and drive for a better future. Thank you so much, Kit. Um, well, so, um, we'll now move to, to, towards the discussion. Um, I'll ask a few questions, but the, the questions are already stacking up in the Q&A, so I'll try to throw it to the audience as, uh, as, as soon as possible. Um, I, I, as I said to our panelists before we started, please don't feel you need to answer every question, just chip in if it's, um, if it's particularly germane to you. But um, I wanted to start with the sort of the, 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 the issue of confidence, which Sir Michael identified. Um, as Kit said, you know, crime has gone down um, in, you know, in, in the aggregate. So why is it that confidence has fallen? Is this a generalised issue? Or is this about particular uh, areas or communities we saw we saw with the Met? And I'll, I'll just throw in something here. I, mean, I was um, I took a leave of absence from the CPS to to help write the Tory manifesto in 2019, and one of the reasons it had you know we will hire more police officers front and centre was there, there seemed to be a sense from people that you know just just that their, the quality of their the, the public space was getting was getting was getting worse around them. But then there's obviously a clash between that and the uh, the fact that crime is increasingly moving online. So so. What, what are the drivers of, the, of that confidence issue and, and how do we address them? I think a lot of it, Rob, is around, um, is around communication, if I'm completely honest. I mean, I think we're very good now at talking about all the problems. We're not always necessarily terribly good at talking about some of the solutions, some of the great work. And I do think that, there's a bit of I would say this, wouldn't I? But I do think that's where PCCs on the ground can be a really, really useful tool, actually, for police forces. Um, you know, and I, I spend my time, and I know my colleagues around the country do as well, getting out, talking to residents about the really good stuff and also feeding back um, having you know having that opportunity to speak to residents in their own in their own communities and feeding back to the police what the issues are and then explaining actually what we're doing, I think is a really powerful tool. Robert, can I comment on that? Or please, yeah. yeah. So, uh, first of all, I, I uh, strongly endorse the, the remarks of Lisa and Kit uh, preceding this. Um, on, I do think it's important to rebuild confidence. I do think the loss of confidence is a major issue. I do think policing by consent, which is a a long and honourable British tradition and admired around the world is really important. And so we do need to address it. And I think it's partly about vigorously tackling the various scandalous things we've heard about in the last few months, which I don't want to go into particularly, uh, and the way in which leadership that Kit emphasised uh, tackles those issues, uh, the successor and others. That is really important. But I also think it's about, uh, and again, Kit emphasised this, uh, and Lisa, doing the basics right. Uh, so making sure that policing is visible in communities, making sure that PCCs, which they are doing, get out there. Why well, I think they're, they've been a very successful innovation over the last decade. All of that is important. Uh, and then detecting crimes more effectively. We've got a big shortage of detectives. Uh, digital forensics are too slow. There are, so there are big challenges just in getting the basics to work in the way you'd want to. And then on the wider issues where uh, uh, Kit made a very important point about what, we, what policing should not be about. And for that, we need much stronger partnerships between policing, social services, education, health, and indeed the CPS within the criminal justice system. The, uh, the, the other CPS. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Sorry, we, yeah. we, we were there first, by the way, if I could just... Um... Crown prosecution. <laughs> yes. and, then, and, then, and then also, uh, again, my colleagues have, uh, on the panel have mentioned this, but strengthening prevention, so making, making avoiding crime in the way that has happened, uh, I think you have the example of car crime, uh, but it's also happened with burglary. It needs to happen with uh, financial services tech companies uh, in relation to schools now. Uh, so I think all of that is, is good. And I think if we get the basics right and tackle vigorously these scandals, the confidence can be addressed and that will be very important for future policing. So so I think Michael and, and Lisa did right. So Michael in particular, I'm old enough to remember when the... Um, uh, the confidence measure was brought in for policing. If you remember, it used to be a, a, a measure. And there was a huge amount of academic research gone into how could you move the confidence measure? What could you do? Was it about 
you know, leaflets was all the rest. In the end, it came down to just doing a bloody good job. Yeah. Uh, right. And 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 that the confidence would follow. There was always going to be a lag. Um, but if you, as Michael said, if you got the basics absolutely right, uh, then then sooner or later you would win through on on confidence. Now, you have to overlay that with exactly as he said, the vigorous dealing with some of these internal scandals, um, but also recognizing that, as Michael quite rightly said at the start, there are thousands and thousands of police officers who you don't hear about every single day doing lots of great things. Um, but you do that does percolate through. And and while everybody has a, a story uh, from a friend or a relative about how um, you know they've had a, a perhaps a poor interaction with the police or we never see a cop around here or we've never had anybody on our street if you do a good job if you visit every burglary if you drive things you know street robbery down if you clear people out uh, of, on antisocial behavior in the local park in the end people start to recognize that you've done a good job it might take time but sooner or later they think oh actually do you know what we haven't had a burglary for a long time. Things are in good shape. We have seen a police officer in the high street and you, you went on confidence. So I, I think that the, we're wrong. To, we, are, we, should, we are right to be concerned about confidence, but we are wrong to concentrate it, on it rather than just saying, well, it will follow if we do a bloody good job. Uh, so let's get crime down. Let's not talk about process and um, uh, PR Let's talk about crime and focus on that clear mission and get the numbers down and the rest will follow. Thanks. Okay, I think that's very, yeah, um, that makes all the sense in the world. Um, the, the next question I wanted to ask, I mean, it, it, and it's sort of cropped up a little bit in, in, in the conversation, but the, um, you know, we, we, we have 43 police officers, police forces in, um, you, know, uh, you know, all doing their, their separate things. Yet, as you've all been saying, the, you know, the new crimes are you know, the, 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 on, the online and fraud. Crimes, these are these are much less amenable to traditional boundaries than um, before. Do you, do, does do, do, the, do, do, the, do the sort of current structures still still make sense? I mean, does the, does the traditional model um, still makes sense, or, or, or is it a case that you need to, to peel, uh, pull, you, either in the, you have strengthen links between the centre and the forces, or or split responsibilities in a different way? Shall I say something about that? Start with that. So, I definitely think we need to give some thought uh, to where to how we acquire the right capability, whether that is uh, held in the office of constable uh, or held elsewhere. And secondly, where that should be located. Uh, so, for example, you will know, uh, Robert. People on this call will know that there is some, you know, high-level capability that British policing has that is held at the National Crime Agency, and it's held centrally because it's not sensible for every force to have that capability because they don't necessarily need it. And and you know, reproducing it forty-one times in England and Wales uh, would be uh, crazy. Um, so, the there definitely needs to be a discussion about how that sits. Um, and where it sits. The other discussion is about who's doing it in government. Uh, so, for example, there is quite a lot of effort goes into fraud uh, at the um, Treasury, right? So HMRC are quite a big player in the in the fraud and, and economic crime uh, area. So are the NCA. Every police force has its own uh, fraud and cyber unit. Um, you know, we've got lots of organizations that are playing in the field and we've got the Cyber Security Center. We've obviously got UKIC and, you know, GCHQ. I think uh, Ben Wallace has been successful in getting quite a lot of money for a cyber warfare um, uh, uh, unit up, up in the north, uh, which will have a big impact. Now, in the, in the Venn diagram of offending online, all of these things cross over. Uh, and so the question is, is where is where is the coherent home for it and what is the coherent structure? And I think that's a live discussion at the moment. Thanks. Um, do either of the other panelists want to chip in or we can? I'll comment. If Lisa wants to go, I'll, go, I'll comment after Lisa. No, I think I think there is some I think it's a conversation that needs to be had. Uh, what I would say is I would be very nervous of moving too far away from the local. Um, certainly residents appreciate local policing. They want to know that there is a Surrey police officer there when they need somebody. I don't think that, and, and both Sir Michael and, and Kip have mentioned, 
the importance, um, as we all know, about visible policing and Bobby's on the beat. And I think that certainly in Surrey, um, where extra officers are helping us get back to officers who really, really know their patch, they know the roads, they know the families, you know, they will go around doing an enormous amount of preventative work by making sure they're knocking on doors, visiting people who are vulnerable, visiting um, those families who perhaps have kids who are a little bit more troublesome than others. Um, so I would hate for us to move away from that localised policing, but I think that there is absolutely strength in numbers in some areas. Um, and a classic example for us in Surrey is, you know, we work very closely and collaboratively with some Sussex police um, on a lot of areas, you know, major crime being one of them, and uh, roads policing and, and other ops areas. So I think it's about finding the right balance where we're giving the right thing to residents, but we're also doing everything that we can with the best capability and technology possible um, to make sure that we're tackling those those serious national issues. And as you say, you know, cyber and fraud is is huge because you can it means that you can commit a crime from anywhere in the world. Um, the targets anywhere in the world and we have to be very alive to that and not naive about it. Thank you. Um, so we've got um, well, 23 questions just on the um, on, on the, on the Q&A um, and more coming in. So I'm going to try and rattle, A, rattle through them and B, sort of um, combine topics as, as much as I can. But I, I guess we have to start with the first question we were asked from um, Remus Big, which is, um, what do you think of the IOPC reports earlier this month? Is this culture in the Met deep rooted and historical? Why does this culture exist? I mean, we saw the chart about confidence in the Met. I mean, the statistic I throw in here is that um, uh, from the CRED report recently and the Commission on Racial Equalities and, Dispar uh, and Disparities, that you know the the homicide rate for for young black males was twenty four times the homicide rate for young white males, and and you know most of the um, the black people in the U you know a very large proportion of the black people in, in the UK um, are, are are based are based in London. I mean, is, is that you know what what you know what what's gone wrong basically? Um. Can I comment on the, just on the previous question briefly, I strongly support uh, what Lisa said about local crime and responsiveness and the 43 police forces. We didn't want to go into the, should we have 15 police forces or 10 police forces and, and do away with 43. We, we, we like, the, having looked at the, the police and crime commissioner role, we think um, local police forces dealing with local crime and being responsive is very important. We looked at the pattern of crime and how to address it um, in a significant way. Um, and that means at the same time as you strengthen local policing, you also want to strengthen the center and some region, regional functions. And our report will go into that. But on the on the, on the, the point you're making about the confidence in the Met, it is partly about these, uh, these so-called scandals. It's partly about the need to deal with them in a public visible way so that they're clearly being tackled and not swept under the carpet, which is a bit harsh, but, but there's an element of that in, in, in what's happened. And it's, it's also about uh, getting the responsiveness, and in London it's a huge police force, so getting the basic command units to deal uh, effectively and fairly with, with uh, local policing issues, and building the changing nature of the police force itself. We've got a welcome growth in the number of women police officers, we've got a welcome growth uh, in the number of ethnic minority police officers, including from the African Caribbean community, but it's not fast enough and we need to accelerate that. And then uh, we do need to make sure that powers such as stop and search, which um, are very useful powers to the police, are used in an evidently fair way uh, and not uh, in, in a way that looks uh, really quite disturbing when you see the statistics. Yeah, so look, from my point of view, that obviously the events at Charing Cross Police Station were horrendous. Um, and whether they point to a wider issue uh, will come out of Louise Casey's work. As you know, she's been engaged to have a look at Met culture we've also got uh, the inspectorates well the angelini review that's looking at the issues around the the, the wayne cousins and uh, who killed sarah everard in that appalling crime um how he became to be a met police officer and then whether there are wide issues as well so there will be conclusions to be drawn uh from that uh, but in any large organization as i say you are you're going to get these cultural issues the the question uh from time to time the question is whether there is a enough of a structure and an internal culture of calling that out and being able to call that kind of behavior out safely uh, that gives people confidence that if and when it does bubble up it's dealt with swiftly um and and stamped on uh, because you're right where uh, you know the these incidents even if it is isolated and as i say those inquiries will conclude whether it is or it isn't, even if it is isolated, it still has a massive impact on people's perception of the Met uh, because we all consume it as if it were local to us. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the media has a way of, of conflating these things. 
On your second uh, point, uh, usefully sometimes, uh, but a way of conflating these things. On your second point, I'm very, in many ways, tragic though it is, I'm very pleased you asked me that, Robert, because I often get challenged on disproportionality on stop and search. Uh, but I've yet to be challenged on the disproportionality of victims of knife crime, uh, particularly in, in London. Um, and it is deeply, deeply alarming. Back in 2008, uh, when I was Deputy Mayor for Policing, we had a similar spike in, in knife crime, and it was similarly skewed, sadly, towards young uh, black men um, who were being killed in ever-increasing numbers. And we took strong assertive action to turn that around, which we successfully did over the ensuing three or four years. Uh, but it's challenging and difficult, um, and it can only be done if you recognise that disproportionality, if you recognise this awful statistic that a significant number, you know, the vast majority of, of the 30 who were killed in December last year were BME young males. Um, and it's only if you acknowledge that issue that you can start to, to get behind the causes and do the really important work you need to do, confrontational, difficult though it may be, to save their lives. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions from, from the media, um, if you uh, have infiltrated the Q&A. Um, Mark Easton, who I'm assuming is Mark Easton from the BBC, um, if police don't look for missing persons or deal with mental health crises or do preventative work around drugs and alcohol, who will? Have cuts to social services been the problem? So uh, it, it, I don't think it's necessarily the case, sorry to come in first, that the police shouldn't do missing persons. They absolutely should. The question is what then happens? Right. So, for example, you, you, if you talk to response police officers, they will say they'll come on shift, they'll get a call to do a mental health miss, but they'll find the person then they'll spend the rest of the shift sh sitting in casualty, um, uh, waiting for them to be admitted or for a bed to be found. Uh, so they're doing basic guarding uh, in the hospital. Now, even if the capacity eventually comes on stream, whether they should be doing that basic guarding function, which I mean, I hesitate to say, but it absorbs a huge amount of response time. Uh, you'll find a lot of police officers sitting in, in admissions in hospital, uh, waiting just to hand somebody over. These are the kind of seemingly small individual items, but when you add them all up, it makes a big difference on, on capacity. Now, there are some areas of innovation. So uh, Humberside Police, for example, have done some very strong work with their local mental health trust and their local uh, CCGs to talk about this issue. And as a result, they've reached an understanding at a modus operandi, which has seen, I think, a 25 to 30 percent drop in capacity demands on the police. Right. So it is possible to do. Uh, the question is, can you galvanize the whole public sector to recognize uh, that while the police definitely have a job to do as first responder, dealing with the consequence there, thereafter of that response may need uh, closer working from other parts of the public sector. Yeah, and I think that's where PCCs really should be working very, very hard across partnerships to bring together. I mean, to give you an idea, in Surrey, a third of our, about a third of our demand in Surrey is mental health. We do 42 mental health cases a day, Surrey Police. And this is a relatively small force and seven missing persons cases every day. Um, and as Kit says, it's the time that that takes officers. Um, and, you know, I work very closely right across with part, you know, partners, mental health partners and others right across because police will always turn up. And, and we know that the police will always turn up where an ambulance service may feel they're not required, where a hospital may feel they're not required or somebody else says that's not really up to us. They know the police always will. And that's something that needs to change. I, I just want to reinforce that and, and to go to Mark's question. I'm certainly not arguing that the police shouldn't follow up missing persons. They should and they have to, and they always will because they feel the responsibility that Lisa and um, uh, has, has just talked about. But we do need to so, social services where they're appropriate, mental health trust where they're appropriate, to do the job of preventing people going missing better. Exactly. Picking them up when they're uh, when they're found. I, I talked to two police officers in the Midlands who had. Um, gone to find a, a missing 16 year old boy, found him, taken him back to the care home and the care home and said, actually, he's meant to be with his parents tomorrow. Would you mind taking him there? His parents lived over 100 miles away and the police drove him there. That's two officers time for all that drive. That's not what we expect the police to do. So that we, there is a there is a social care and a mental health trust issue uh, and they need to do that. And that's what I'm talking about with real practical partnerships. So the police will always be the last resort, but that needs to be less often because the other services are doing a better job. And, um, and, and to be fair, just to say, in one particular area, we are recognising that. So the PCSC bill, which is coming back to the Commons on Monday, does have this 
serious violence duty in there, which for the first time places a statutory duty on other public sector organizations, health, local authorities to come alongside the police uh, to try and prevent uh, serious violence in any community. Now, you know, this is a recognition of the fact that you need a kind of coalition of the willing in every geography to prevent these issues. The police will always have to deal with the consequences, but prevention is much better than, than cure. Hmm. And um, uh, Kit, if, if you'll stay on the line, um, David Barrett of the, of the Mail has a, a question for you, which is, um, you noted that the Office of Constable may not be the future of all crime fighting. Uh, do you see more responsibilities being passed to specialist civilian investigators, such as those with IT skills, and how would that affect overall police staffing levels? Uh, well, I do think, yes, as we as we look to dealing with some of these uh, cyber crimes, in particular online crime, uh, but others, that the, the, the use of of other expertise or particularly focused expertise beyond uh, the generalized expertise and capability of constable will be helpful. And that that's the truth already, right? So we've got, you know, whether it's forensic accountants at the National Crime Agency or uh, programmers sitting in West Midlands Police doing data analytics um, around crime prevention, these are all skills that the police need to acquire. From, from my point of view, I obviously want to get the, the office account up to the target that we've set um, of 20,000 extras, you know, which I think in theory should be the highest number the country's ever had, um, and then maintain that number. Uh, but alongside that, police staff and in other organizations, bringing uh, complementary skills that enable the police to, to, to do the job in new areas enabled by technology, I think will be critical to success, um, as you would expect, right? I mean, that's as I say, that happens already. We just need more. In, in our final report, we'll build on what Kit has just said and, and set out different uh, uh, proposals for the future of the policing career, the police learning and training and development, which definitely needs to improve the quality of leadership that Kit has emphasised and this need for new skills in these new areas, which clearly the traditional Bobby on the beat, important though he or she is, cannot do uh, currently. So we need these other skills to be brought in on top of the 140 something thousand police officers will be when Kit hits his 20,000 target. Um, um, on, a, on, a, well, on a related note, I mean, we've had a, a few questions um, on, on the issue of police leadership and how you how you build how you build that and how you how you how you how you, how you empower the the you know, the, the, the and, and the, the, when we talked about the question of capacity earlier, you know how how you ensure that the you know you have the best people doing doing the best job. Any any thoughts on on that um, to amplify what you've already said? I'll, I'll comment first, and then Lisa, Lisa may well have the task uh, of, uh, of um, influencing, well, will have, does have the task of influencing police leadership, and I'd be very interested in her views, but I, I think the, um, we, we, need, we need leaders who have, are able to engage the public uh, in the police uh, alongside the PCCs, and who uh, can tackle these deep-rooted cultural issues when they arise in, in a more vigorous way. And the other thing I think we, we will want to talk about in our final report is, is carving out real uh, investment in police leadership development from the sergeants that, that Kit mentioned all the way up. Uh, because when there are a period of spending cuts as through the era of austerity, one of the things that goes is investment in leadership training and development, and that needs to be put right. Yeah, and I'd, I'd agree with that. I think one of the things, I mean, I've been fortunate, I've had, um, my career has spanned both public and private sector. And I thought it was particularly interesting, actually, what Kit said earlier about, um, you know, the ability to fail and having that safe space in which to fail, particularly when it comes to innovation and technology. And I spent five years working in finance, particularly in venture capital. And probably one of the things I took from there that I think is relevant wherever you go is, is fail fast. You know, have, have that, um, be given that permission to fail fast. And I think, you know, and I've only been in post for nine months and I don't have a background in policing, but one of the things that um, has struck me is how policing is absolutely changing. You know, there are very few things in any walks of life now where it's a career for life. And I think that in policing, this is not necessarily a bad thing. I would like to see from a leadership point of view, more people coming into policing um, from perhaps other sectors, but also reaching out to other sectors um, particularly the private sector, some areas of the private sector, and learning some of the leadership skills there. Um, because I think it's really only by seeing different leadership styles in different sectors that we can really learn. I think that, you know, whether it's the College of Policing, whether it's the Police Foundation, um, Home Office, us as BCCs, absolutely have a duty to look at what, what is best in class, and not just best in class in policing, 
or the public sector, but what, you know, what are the best leadership skills um, and what can policing and police leaders learn from those? Well, I mean, we just had a question pop up as, as you were speaking, saying, um, should, should this involve the, um, the resurrection and expansion of the direct entry scheme? Well, in theory, yes. I mean, look, many years ago, I can remember a, a member of police staff coming up to me with a right smile and saying, oh, you know, it's amazing. Those 20 weeks at Hendon must be incredible training because it means 30 years later, you could be an IT director and a property director and an HR person, all that kind of stuff. Now, the, and it used to be the case that between, other than for specialist capabilities, between Hendon and the command course, there was no sort of professional development at all. Now, happily, that has changed. Um, and I know the college is, the College of Policing in particular is having a new look at what it can do around leadership training uh, for policing, uh, because the, you know, in my experience of whatever, 25 years now in the public sector, pretty much all problems uh, come down to questions of, of leadership and capability, um, whether it's from a school or a GP surgery or a hospital or a police force, you know, it, it, it's at the heart of everything. Um, and so in a, a strong investment and an emphasis on that it, it will be key. And, and the great news, of course, is this is a known science, uh, right? It's not hard. There are large private sector organizations and indeed public sector ones who've harnessed this ability and recognize how to develop people through the organization. Uh, CPD is now becoming standard in, in many large organizations and, and bring them on. Um, and we need to, to catch up with that. But as I say, given that policing is still, notwithstanding the, the changes recently, a kind of 30 year uh, profession and it's a command organization, looking at the, the rank of sergeants as the bedrock of the future of, of policing, I think is, is a critical first step. And if we can build the skills, capability, you know, the, the idea that people should be investing in themselves and the organization should be investing in them at an early stage, then you build that internal culture um, of, of kind of excellence. In terms of, of direct entry, yeah. I mean, look where, where we can acquire skills from externally, we should be doing. Uh, we've already got uh, direct entry detectives now coming in through police now. I think last year or the year before I attested the first 267 direct entry detectives coming through the police now route. So that there are these different avenues of access are developing and certainly through the Uplift program, although it is skewed towards younger applicants, we are getting more mature people coming through uh, with a variety of skills. And that's something to be encouraged. And as we move into the last year of the Uplift, if you like, um, we'll complete the 20,000, hopefully in the next 12 months. But then we've got to maintain that number. And that gives us the ability to look at the skills and diversity mix across the whole of policing on an ongoing basis, not just as part of this big upswing. Can I just um, <laughs> highlight something um, that, that Kit just mentioned about police, police now? I, 20 years ago, I was involved in the uh, uh, foundation of Teach First, which brought uh, teachers from... Uh, good yeah. universities, people, graduates from good universities into teaching and uh, and provide a really good basis initially in London and then around the big cities. And many of those people now are leaders in the teaching profession of academies and so on. And I think if we get police now right and continue to build on it, many of the leaders of the future may well be coming in through that route. So I think that's been a really important development that looks quite modest in numbers at the moment, but will be very significant over the long run. Um, we're not going to have time to get to it, unfortunately, but there's a fascinating comment from Robert Beckley in the um, Q&A, if, if anyone can see it, um, whose two sons have just uh, joined as you know, new constables, and he says that you know they, he completely gets your, your point, Kit, but they rarely see a sergeant, let alone an, an, an inspector, and that, you know, there's, there's a fascinating sort of issue about how you combine efficiency with, with development and, and ownership of, of crimes. Um, well, what, just, what... just to say, Robert, we are monitoring the new entrants extremely closely uh, by survey, and, you know, uh, happily, the vast majority of them are saying they're having a lovely time and it's fulfilling their expectations. But uh, there is a lower proportion that are saying they're getting the kind of senior contact input that they want to see. And we're looking at it force by force basis and say, come on, now you need to start investing in these people and making them feel like you're, you're you know, bringing them on. So we're looking specifically at that issue. Um, a couple of questions um, so basically we're talking about the police should we talk, be talking about the Crown Prosecution Service um, mm -hmm. as, as, as the, the, the root of quite a lot of the, the, prob the, the problems in, in confidence um, in particular um, one, someone asks on um, lo uh, low rates of uh, rape conviction Lisa do you want to comment 
I'm, I'm happy to say something about that. I mean, so I until recently had responsibility for that area of work. It now sits with Victoria Atkins at the at the MOJ. Um, look, I don't think it's about one particular part of the machine on on rape and serious sexual offences. It's pretty obvious that the whole machine had effectively let everybody down. And you know, I stood up in the house and apologised. Uh, for that and for the very low numbers of, of convictions. We are now putting in place a much more, what we call operations deteriorate, collaborative approach, because in truth, if these two critical organizations just sit back and fire pot shots at each other, uh, we'll never make any progress. Uh, they need to collaborate on investigations. They need to shift the culture towards an investigation of the suspect rather than of the, the victim. Um, and make sure that they have a, a sort of coherent sense of the mission in each and every investigation. Now, happily, in the five forces that we've uh, started that project in, soon to be expanded, um, it's looking hopeful and the early signs are, are good. But I think we are um, wrong to single out one part of the machine um, as being particularly to blame for a problem. It is a machine. It is a conveyor that has to work together. There are things that can be done um, uh, to ease. There are particular blockages uh, where they could work together to, to sort them out. One of the ones particularly, for example, that's uh, uh, concerning me at the moment is around uh, the disclosure guidelines uh, that have been put out by the Attorney General's office, which are having a big impact on police capacity. Talking to the AG's office, Solicitor General is now having a look been around touring police forces saying, okay, what impact is this having? What can we do to try and sort this out and reach a, a better compromise that allows us to get what we both need? So I'm, I'm hesitant in this machine to, to point the finger. Similarly, for example, on, on legal aid, right? Uh, we're in conversation at the moment about trying to get uh, uh, legal aid coverage for um, uh, legal advice to attend at the police station. Uh, because we know if that happens, we're more likely to get an early guilty plea, which saved lots of money down the down the process in the system. Right? Might seem like a quite simple thing to do, but it takes a bit of work to get us there. So it's a system. We shouldn't pick out one particular part. I, I, I mean, talking to ordinary police officers and people from the CPS, there is a has been traditionally a bit of a tendency for each to blame the other, and each needs to take responsibility. And we need to get that relationship working well. I'm glad glad to hear about the the, the evidence you just brought to bear, Kit. Because I think uh, uh, what the public want is um, where there are offenders who are identified and there's evidence they should be uh, you know, charged and, and, and then prosecuted. Uh, and that needs to be a collaboration. And it hasn't been working nearly as well as it should. And it does need to be addressed. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think Kit highlights a couple of the, the very, he actually spots a couple of the very serious issues, one around disclosure. Um, and that's absolutely true. And I think that it's going to be better working together because, as Sir Michael says, it is, it sort of doesn't matter. We can all squabble at the top, but we need to sort of take a grip. And again, again it comes back down to leadership. It really, really does, because the public don't care who the, who the problem is with. They really, really don't. And us blaming the other side and then blaming us um, doesn't help the public. And I think that, you know, as, as many, like many PCCs, I chair the, um, our local HS, Surrey's Criminal Justice Board. And I do think that, you know, that they are forums for doing some really, really good work and collaborating. But we need to be better right across the board as leaders. We need to be better. Yeah, I, I don't want, just to say, I, I, I don't want to have conversations anymore where... Um, the police say to the CPS, oh, you're not giving us enough early advice. And the CPS say, oh, well, your file quality isn't good enough. I would like a conversation where we all sit down and say, how are we going to get the victim through to court? Mm. Make sure we get a conviction, please, together. Yeah. That's yes. what. That's where it needs to be. Yeah, and, and by the way, Kit, that, that conversation that you described, that the, the unhelpful one was happening back in my time in number 10 in the early 2000s. And so we really do need to move that culture on. And the, somebody once said to me about any big public service problem, first question to ask is not who's to blame it's what should we do about it and how do we yes, get to work exactly but I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure we've ever had a, 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 an event with the CBS with, with so many really good questions that we're not going to have time, time to get to. Um, but I will ask our panellists just for one final contribution each, um, which is to, in a, in, a, in a single sentence, how, how optimistic are you about the, about the challenges facing um, pretty, the policing? I mean, you know, are, we, are, we, you know, are, are, we, are we almost there? Are we, is there a mountain to climb? If you want my, my, I think there is a mountain to climb, but that we will climb it, and that, that depends on leadership and modernising the police so that they're a digital police force for the digital age rather than an analogue police force for a digital age. But it can be done, and I think it will be done. 
Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I remain incredibly optimistic about it. There absolutely is a mountain, but I meet brilliant, dedicated men and women every single day who are determined to deliver the best possible police service um, for the residents you know, of Surrey and beyond. So I'm very, very confident that we will get there. So I am uh, very optimistic uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, we've got this big new shot of youth and energy uh, going into UK policing. And, and you shouldn't underestimate the impact. As I say, we'll have by the end of it around 148,000 police officers. Of those 45 odd thousand, we'll have three years or fewer in terms of experience. They'll be new, uh, which presents some organizational problems, but nevertheless is new energy, new people, a new look, a new feel, which is a, a bit of a refresh, which is, is great. Um, and we're also at a, a pivotal point in terms of the, the kind of development into the 21st century of, of British policing. I know we're uh, a few years into it, but nevertheless, policing is now definitely looking towards a new, more data technology enabled way of preventing and fighting crime, given that successfully over the last 30 years, they have driven crime down very significantly. Um, and now they need to think about how they go to the next level. So, yes, there's lots to be optimistic about. But it doesn't mean to say we haven't got some significant problems to overcome on the way. Well, well thank you very much to uh, the Right Honourable Kate Malthouse, to Lisa Townsend and to Sir Michael Barber. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your questions. I'm really sorry we couldn't get, uh, get to all of them. And please join us again for another Centre for the, well, for a, a series of wonderful Centre for Policy Studies events that are coming up and will be in your